Regardless of whatever that basset hound and you have concocted, you're not going to make him a sled dog. Those damn fish are just lying around. They had this uh, place where I could hide out front, and I had a distraction tool. Now, Robert, of course, has surprised some Domino's guys and Amazon delivery guys before. Some say these two trainers were quietly in the shadows. Robert Weatherwax, last of the legendary Lassie trainers from the world's greatest movie dog training family, was quietly hidden in his TV work. And Christoph Klugston Elite Action K9 trainer was traveling from the Sub-Zero Arctic to the sweltering jungle heat training dogs on three continents. But a chance meeting changed all of that. Now, Robert and Christoph have joined forces and they're breaking the silence. For the first time, the secretive and hidden world of the movie dog trainer and the science of the elite tactical trainer will be revealed. That's right, they are out of the shadows. Welcome to Tactical Practical. Here we are at podcast number 13, and it's not going to be unlucky. <laughs> We're going to delve into another high requested topic, and this is a big one. And there, again, as always, we're going to get to it from a surprisingly different type of view than you've seen with other people. And this topic is the separation anxiety and what it means and what you can do. So, number one, let's just define terms. Anxiety means fear, basically. And uh, there's a fear of the separation. The separation is the dog being separated from other dogs, separated from the person, the family, being left alone, basically. It's being left alone, and there's a fear of that and their reactions to that. And we're going to just jump right into this because Robert really wants to get into this one. So, okay, Robert, let's fire away on separation. <laughs> anxiety. Yeah. You know, the thing about separation anxiety and, and a lot of the, the behavior modification that I do with dogs, I really don't have any idea what I'm going to do when I walk to the door. Because um, it's a little different for every dog. Some dogs have different problems. Some dogs are like uh, destroying the furniture. Uh, some dogs are barking endlessly. Uh, some dogs are, you know, fishing, you know, counter surfing. Uh, whatever they're doing, they're doing things that they wouldn't do if you weren't there. Almost as if by doing it, you'll suddenly reappear, right? Um, and I, it's just an insecurity of, like, like Christoph said, uh, of a being, some some living being, uh, is not there to provide uh, security. Uh, so this is part of a lot of this is tied into why I believe that crate training is so important, um, because if you teach a dog to be able to be in a crate, um, sometimes that can provide a lot of comfort for dogs that what I call that fear of open spaces, what's that term? Um, yeah, agoraphobia. yeah, agoraphobia or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so basically it, that's what dogs have in a large room when you're gone. It's kind of like agoraphobia. And um, what happens is, you know, if you teach them to, to love a crate, you know, just feed him in there, have his toys in there, even just have it open for him to access on a daily basis, by the time you actually leave, and that's going to be a security uh, place that they run to. And a lot of times what I would do with dogs in certain situations is uh, I used to use those baby monitors. You know, I'd put a baby monitor in the house where the dog normally ends up doing the damage. And then I'd go outside and pretend to leave, start up the car, whatever that stuff. Simulate the leaving and then come back if I see anything going on on the baby monitor. Uh, I'll run back in like the house is on fire. What's going on in here? Oh, you know. The dog's like, whoa, like, how did he know, right? Um, so then, of course, we'll do it again. You know, there's a lot of different ways you can do it. You can, you can set up the leaving. Uh, you know, I've had dogs that used, uh, I had one dog, I remember I was working in Simi Valley, and the dog jumped the fence um, every time they left. As soon as the car went down the street, the dog jumped over the fence. So they had this uh, place where I could hide out front, and I had a distraction tool. Uh, in my case, you know, it's like a chain collar. And I knew where the dog was going to escape. So uh, we simulated the leaving, right? And what happened is as soon as I heard the dog uh, approaching the fence, I threw the chain on the other side of the fence where it, it, the dog simultaneously got to the fence and heard this big boom, right? He didn't jump the fence, right? And, of course, um, then, you know, we came back and we re-simulated the whole leaving again and all that stuff. And uh, we and the dog, you know, wasn't jumping uh, over the fence for I guess it must have been 
uh, months I had to come back to tune it up again because I guess you know after two or three months it, it faded away. Um, but um, <clears throat> anyway, there's a lot of different kinds of separation anxiety too, I and mean, it could be. It depends on where you keep your dog. If you keep them in the house, they're going to destroy the house. If you put them in the yard, they're going to destroy the yard. Um, they're going to bark at other dogs. They're going to do things that are basically a cry for help. Like somebody, I'm here alone, and no, and my owners have left. Um, so I think that's something you just got to keep in mind with dogs. Make sure that they're okay with you leaving. And um, when you're doing crate training, you want to make sure that you uh, you know teach them to be secure with the door closed while you're there before you ever leave the house um, because everything's incremental everything's worked in stages and uh, you just want to make sure that the dog's prepared for the next stage before you move on to that next stage um, because you know if you skip steps you'll end up going back you go one step forward two steps back and that's not really the way to train a dog wouldn't you agree Christoph? well yes absolutely so this whole thing about structure you're the structuring, you're the training, and uh, this is one of the reasons why my one mentor became insanely the number one guy in the United States for decades because he had a very structured type of training, and so that you would follow this. And so we're talking about the crates now. Some people crates have become a big thing for people. Uh, they're using this. It didn't used to use these. They used to be called sky kennels and stuff because they were the what you were put dogs in when you were flying somewhere but after that they became more popular there of course you can use a wire type wire structured ca a crate or cage they're not as sturdy as the actual the ones we're talking about they can be plastic or actually the higher ones are made out of metal and composite uh, composite plastics and stuff but those are very expensive with like four, four or five hundred dollars a crate but anyway the point being is that these have been implemented into dog training for almost 98% of everyone at this point. And there's an over-reliance on this without understanding that you have to do it, as Robert said, in increments, stepping. You don't just go by, oh, here's a crate, stick them in there for four hours. You cannot do that because they will hate that it'll be a prison. It won't be a den that's welcomed. It'll be a prison cell and they will be fighting like every animal wants to. They don't want to be in prison, but they like to go to their, as as Robert and I all know, these guys were always talking about, their, my man cave, my man cave. They, they love the, their man cave, but if you were just to shove them into a room that's their man cave, but it wasn't a man cave, it was just an empty stark room, they would consider it a prison cell. So you have to look at this, it's how you set it up. That's what I'm getting to, how you set this up. So the crate, you have to do it, one two minutes in like i said another podcast go check out the podcast right before this one actually number 12 and i talk about some of the things about a crate so check that out. i don't want to recover everything i don't want to go over everything we've already talked about in all of our other podcasts so check that podcast out but once you start setting this up and you're you're building up the dog's acceptance of the crate and making it a great place for them you can begin to build the time as robert said you're doing this while you're there. You're not leaving. You're not leaving. And when you start to, to do the leaving, you're doing the fake extraction, as we would say in in the army. This is a fake extraction. You're you're actually just going to put the dog in the crate for a little while, but go outside the front door, close the door, or even start the. Then later you can start the car engine and things like that because they they may be using that as their signal to go crazy. But you haven't left. You're really going to be hiding outside that front door. Now, Robert, of course, has surprised some Domino's guys and Amazon delivery guys before doing this. But barring that happening to you, you you're setting this up so that you can go back in and, and surprise the dog. So the dog never knows when you really leave. That's what we're trying to get to. So the separation can't really happen if the dog really doesn't think you've ever left. And you, you'll start building this time up, up up yeah you got to commit to this this they're not furniture i want to say this over and over and over the dogs are not furniture you have to commit as uh, robert said in our last podcast this is it, it, this is not a cat you know cats are like ah take off ah see you later we don't care but dogs are not that way you know i've never seen cats tearing things apart in sort of a spike because dogs <laughs> 
Yeah, dogs. C- <laughs> cats will do it right in front of you. They don't wait. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I like. Them. <laughs> They're honest. That's what I like about cats. They're honest, right? But, <laughs> but the thing is with this is that you got to build it up. Dogs are not furniture. Anyway, back to you, Robert. Uh, you, you may want to tell us about some of the times you've surprised some of the delivery. Yeah, well, well, I'll, <laughs> yeah. well, I'll tell you, uh, the biggest thing that, that happens when people put their dogs in a crate and then actually go out the door is the dog starts barking, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's something that, uh, you know, it's probably the most common thing that they do because if you haven't conditioned them properly for the crate, prior to leaving that first time, getting in your car. Uh, The dog knows what the car sounds like. He knows the difference between uh, your car and the neighbor's car. Uh, He always knows. And uh, I I used to have a lot of little tricks that I did, but I know that I've heard of other trainers using uh, uh, stimulation collars on the dog inside the crate. Uh, And then when they barked, they were shocking the dog. Well, I just thought, well, that's not creating a positive connotation of, of the crate. Uh, I would never do it that way. I, I want it to be positive. Um, you know, only things that are truly dangerous do I feel you, where you need uh, stimulation uh, training. Uh, things that, you know, like running away and you know, fighting other dogs. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, yeah, avoidance training, exactly. Um, but, you know, most of my training is about putting the dog in into the situation and getting them comfortable with it, whether it's out on the trail, uh, at a public place, uh, a restaurant, whatever, um, you know, or at home alone. Um, so these are things you have to kind of wade, uh, step your feet in. Uh, a little trick I used to have with certain dogs. When they're in the crate, you know, and, and another thing I'd mentioned too, there's those crates that, that where the dog can see a lot, like the open wire crates, or yeah. they tend to be the best because the more that the dog can see, uh, the better it is. Um, because I remember the crates that we had when I was a young trainer, they were like these pet carriers, and they had like little, yeah. like yeah. prison bars, right? That you could see out the, but it was just a slit, right? And they could see out the front, but they couldn't really see around them, you know. Um, so I feel like uh, the fact that you know dogs can see better, I would certainly feel more comfortable myself if I knew what was around me um, when I'm inside that containment area. Uh, and like and like Christoph said, it's not prison. That's it's not prison because of what it represents to the dog. Um, if if you're feeding them in there consistently with the door open, and then as they get comfortable with the door open and not even thinking about it, then you can start closing the door gradually while you're home. Um, later on, um, you know you can start going outside to the mailbox um, and and see how the dog handles that, uh, and then come back. And and every time you return. Uh, you reward the dog when they're in that crate. Every time you leave, you reward the dog. Every time you return, you reward the dog. If we put so much emphasis on the arrival and not on the departure, um, the dog has a lot of anxiety about when you're going to return. It's it's anticipated too much, right? Um, so what I tell my clients to do is to put all the praise on the departure um, and, and kind of fade off on... Uh, I mean, walk, walk in, acknowledge the dog. I'm not saying ignore them completely. I'm just saying walk in, say, you know, hey, hey, Fido, what's going on? Then do put your groceries away, do whatever you got to do. And then when everything settles down, when the dogs are like, oh, they just totally didn't even know I was here, that's when you give them the praise. If you can condition dogs that way to, to not look at your arrival as being immediate gratification, um, then you're kind of reconditioning the dog's brain to believe that, uh, that there's, they don't know what to expect when you return. Because it, you, you used to go, oh, look at the baby, did you miss me? That's fine sometimes for some dogs, but it doesn't work for anxious dogs. Um, so I'd play all that stuff down, and I'd make the departure, you know, give them something to chew on, something to play with, um, you know, something they can't swallow and, and, and choke on, yeah, but yeah. something that uh, yeah. keep them occupied. What that is a discussion about is the emotional states of the dog. So what Robert is saying is that you don't want to feed the fear in some of the emotional states because of the, if the dog is in a bad emotional state, if you're a- a- acting anxious, then that's going to cause a problem for the dog because it's going to feed his uh, desire to be more anxious and be more animated. So you want to be calm if the dog is, is up. But if the dog is down, then you can be more animated to bring the dog up out of the doldrums, as it were. So there's a there's a constant there's a constant uh, 
appraisal of what the emotional state of the dog is, and especially with separation anxiety, which can manifest itself in many different ways, chewing, running around, jumping, uh, tearing, digging, tearing holes, barking. These are the major ways that we'll see, or that cause the most problems, that each one of these is an emotional state that the dog is in and the, and the reaction, and they're doing that, and a lot of times, because it's paid off for them. So if they've been barking, 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 and it's hard to ignore a dog that it's barking, that is certainly true. The best thing is to ignore that for however long until the dog is quiet, then immediately reward that dog when he's quiet. And so that you can build this up so the dog will start to eliminate the barking behavior because the barking is not reinforced and the being silent is. Now this can take some time and a lot of trainers don't want to do this and a lot of dog owners, and again, if you're a dog owner, you are a dog trainer, don't want to do it, but this is how you're going to have, it's one of those things about having a dog, and especially dogs with separation anxiety. Now, a lot of people want to just get rid of the dog. That's their cure. Get rid of them. Just get rid of them. Dump them off. I can't handle it. Time. My life can't do this. Blah, blah. So you're a weak person is what that means, and you don't have the skills, and we're giving you the skills. We're telling you what to do. Not saying it's easy. It's just like everything else, you know. If, if you if you want to be an athlete at anything, it's not easy. If you want to be if you want to become a brain surgeon, it's not easy. Same thing. You got to ride that out because it will get better. It will get better, smoother seas. I mean, Robert was uh, was a sailor, and I definitely they bad seas. You know, at some point, it's not going to always be bad seas. You're going to get some smooth sailing, as as the term goes. So, Want to add to that, Robert, on the uh, emotional? Yeah, situation? well, you know, a, a, a lot of um, um, we, we do certain things a certain way. Um, when we walk down the street, um, we always turn right at the first corner, and then we go down that street, and then we turn left at the next street. And uh, I tell my clients, you know, to change that up a lot because you don't want your dog to start getting patterned to what uh, their expectations are. So sometimes you have to change the expectations. Uh, sometimes you're gone for a minute. Sometimes you're gone for an hour. Um, sometimes you get a really great reward. Sometimes you don't get so much of a reward. Uh, the thing is, is there has to be a possibility in the dog's mind that they're going to get something great by having to stay in that crate. Um, that's that's really what it is. And when they, when they come out of that crate, um, you're going to treat them like they're the best thing that ever happened because, uh, you know, that was a hard thing for them. And what's going to happen over time, and you can use this to transition with the baby monitor, um, you can start leaving that door open with the crate and start going out of the house and uh, seeing what the dog does when you leave. In, and, you know, first it's five minutes, then it's ten minutes. I've always said in my book that if you can get a dog to do anything for 15 minutes, you can pretty much get them to do it forever. Um, but getting to that 15 minutes is the hard point. Um, you know, uh, like Carl Miller, for example, uh, he ended up dying of, of cancer uh, from smoking. Uh, but he always told me, he said, you know, if you can't get your dog to stay or do anything for as long as it takes to smoke a cigarette, well, then it's just not very good. Um, and um, I think he was right about that. That's why uh, Christoph and I are about distance and, yeah. and duration. Yeah. Uh, being able to do things for, you know, and you build up duration incrementally as well. Just like last episode, we were talking about puppies, how you, they don't have any bladder control and they don't have any retention when they're little. But as they get older, all those things start to grow, and you have to read how much they can take. And you can tell there's ways, and you can see anxiety, you can see fatigue in a dog. Uh, a lot of times when a dog pants, it's not because they're hot. It's not because they're thirsty. It's because they're under stress. Um, yawning could be another stress uh, time. Um, but I find that yawning actually tends to release a little bit each time. They yawn, they release a little bit of tension. Um, a lot of dogs that I work who've never been trained on the first lesson, a lot of times I'll see a lot of yawning. Um, but I don't think that's really, I think that's just like a natural decompression process. It's not me telling the dog, do this, be in this position. Uh, because in the beginning, it's not that important. It's really more important about the dog embracing whatever it is, embracing you leaving, embracing training, embracing the walk, embracing going to the vet. I mean, like, if you take your dog to a vet, and they throw him down on a steel table and hold his head down, um, of course, he's not really going to like it that much, okay? Um, but if you go in, he gets a treat. Uh, the, the veterinary assistant is very nice and very caring. Um, you know, just be real careful about, you know, what kind of uh, 
connotation you give your dog because one bad experience in a Location, particular place yeah. or yeah, situation, yeah. exactly, it's all situational, um, they'll begin to believe that that's what's going to happen every time they're in that situation. Mm -hmm. So um, you have to go back to that the scene of the crime and do some fun things in that area, uh, you know, bring their ball. If they like something and they're afraid of a place or a thing or doing something, have, give them their woody, you know, give them their, their toy that they like the best. Um, don't leave them high and dry in a crate uh, with, you know, very, you know, no, nothing to play with, uh, uh, nothing to eat, uh, you know, nothing to drink. Um, you know, you have to really think about, okay, how long am I going to be gone here? Uh, okay, well, how much water should I give them? You know, really, like, plan this out. Like, uh, it's not just, you know, like a, like a hamster, uh, you know, you just put the stuff in, the, in there. You know, you, they're on the wheel, yeah, it's, it's all good. I'm out of here. Um, yeah. But, yeah, just, you know, think about your dog's uh, state of mind when you leave, you know. Uh, a lot of people don't discover uh, separation anxiety until their couch uh, gets, you know, just into a, a million pieces, yeah. uh, ground up, and diced. Um, then they realize, you know what, I think my dad, dog has a problem with being alone. Um, you know, the, the neighbors complaining, that wasn't enough when they were barking. Uh, but now they've gone to uh, more extreme measures to make sure that uh, this doesn't happen anymore. So once you've gotten to that point, you have to eradicate the damage. It's much easier if you set a good feeling about that situation right off the bat. Um, we don't, you know, we don't want to wait until the fire to decide if we have an extinguisher available. Um, you know, just like always think of what could happen. Uh, I think I have a chapter in my book that talks about the concrete jungle, about all the, the hazards that can happen in the house, outside the house. And a dog could, you know, and another thing, never put a, leave a leash and a collar on your dog when you leave the house um, because a panicked dog could hang themselves, theoretically. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, that's not going to help. I always tell people, if you're going to leave a leash and collar on when you're home, that's fine. Um, but don't ever do it when the dog's unattended. Um, and, you know, th those are just a lot of peripheral things. I know I'm kind of going off the main topic, but really uh, I'm thinking about anxiety and Think about something as simple as your dog leaving the house. I might have told this story before, but it's uh, people put the leash and collar on the dog and they just zip out the door. And they wonder why their dog gets so anxious every time they pull the leash out. Um, because they know that it's going to be only seconds before they're out in the street barking at other dogs, right? Um, so <clears throat> you have to put the leash and collar on and then go back and have a cup of coffee, or have a cup of tea, uh, drink some water, whatever, uh, have a piece of toast. Uh, don't. Don't uh, don't give in to your dog's desires when they're they're too overwhelming when they make you uncomfortable. Um, you know, then it's like, oh, you want to go out too much? They don't go. Um, you know, that's you're kind of playing that poke again, and you're changing the expectation of your dog when it becomes uh, too predictable their behavior when it's not acceptable to you. Um, you have to go against the grain to bring that to rein that in. And like Christoph said. Some dogs are real mellow and okay, and, um, you know, they're not very anxious. Uh, you don't have to do too much to fix it. But other dogs really are absolute nervous wrecks um, the second you leave the house. And, and not only if you leave them in the backyard, like in that situation I mentioned previously, um, the dog's going to probably escape. Um, and then, of course, that's an even bigger problem. Um, I mean, from a safety standpoint. Um, but... You know, they're both problems, and um, that's why you have to get them comfortable in whatever environment they're going to be in when you're not home. Uh, and, and also to be comfortable with all the people in the household, not just one person, because a lot of times that dog will misbehave when the one person they love the most leaves the house. Um, so make sure that the duties are shared, the, fa the good duties, like feeding the dog and playing with the dog, walking the dog. It shouldn't all be done by one person in the household. It should be done, you know, by everybody. And, and, and whenever you're training, whether it's house training, the crate training, everybody's involved and everybody has to adhere to the program. You can't have two people ignoring the dog in the crate and the other one's talking to them from across the room, going, it's okay, it's okay. You know, everybody has to be quiet. Everybody has to be on the same page. Because um, there's a lot of moving parts when we're talking about family dog training, where there's kids and uh, babies and, uh, you know, a husband and wife and, and maybe a grandma or, or somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, 
and we have to uh, maintain balance in the household, um, just like we have to maintain maintain balance whenever dogs experience anxiety, whether it's separation anxiety or the anxiety of something that's supposed to happen in their mind, because you set that expectation. So uh, just be aware of uh, the patterns that you're setting with your dog, and and that'll probably help you out a lot. Yeah, the uh, getting to the back where we were at is that. The factor of if you start early, and especially with puppies, it's much easier to try to, you can set the mold, as it were, for good expectations, good things happening, much easier than you can try to go back and cure things. It's, uh, I, don't, I don't want to say that it's three times or five times as hard, but it's much harder to go back and, and fix things where you could have got it off on the right foot as it were initially because that's that's why it's so crucial if you have a puppy this is why we talked about that's why there's so many things to talk about with puppy training and we talked about a bunch of things so look at and watch the prior podcast that we did and we'll be talking more about puppies i'm not going to delve into all that but what i want to emphasize here is that you want to start out by being consistent and you want to also start out by making sure that the dog feels secure this is all about safety and security if the dog feels safe and secure the dog is not going to be panicking because again these words if you look at psychologically anxiety is is an unknown fear a fear of something that's unknown it's an unjustified fear really it just happens watch woody allen movies that's why he's so funny because he has all these fears about stupid things right so that's one of the things and the panic is an is an extenuated uh hyperbolic it's too exaggerated fear i mean this is where and you nobody you can't think anymore and i can get into the reasons why you go into your reptile brain you're no longer thinking you can't do math problems for example when you get in the panic situation that follows a thing if you want to look it up called the yerky dotson paradigm people can you look that up but what i want to what it's important here to notice is that these things are cured ease more easily by setting up the right training to begin with not going back and having to uh, to 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 fix them okay because you are responsible especially with a puppy you're making the personality the the dog's genetics you and the environment are making the personality and that's why robert said you can make dog become almost anything of course again we always i like to use basset hounds as the dogs we pick on but you cannot, we cannot, regardless of whatever that basset hound and you have concocted, you're not going to make him a sled dog. <laughs> He's not going to be winning the Iditarod. He's not going to be winning the Yukon Quest. Sorry to break it to you people out there, but you and your team of basset hounds aren't going anywhere, okay? Uh, <laughs> it would be funny to swatch, but it's uh, they're not going to go anywhere. Barring that, <laughs> you can make a lot of dogs become a lot of things. And again... This is one of the reasons uh, we we are the kings of the tangent. That's yes, we are, and I'm going to tangent again. Robert tangent earlier, and I'm going to tangent now. But one of the reasons why some of the greatest dogs that you've known, Lassie, Rin Tin Tin, some of the dogs that you watch uh, uh, from other people that you see some uh, things, videos from, it's because of the people who are training them believe in that dog. They believe in that dog, so this goes to your belief in the dog, and you make it possible for that dog to do it. Like, Rin Tin Tin could scale a 12-foot wall. That is, for a German Shepherd, of course, that was the real German Shepherds before they got all screwed up in the United States and the genetics and stuff. But that's an incredible height to, to get up to. I mean, to, to, to clear. And Rin Tin Tin was doing that in... A lot of the movies, he was doing that jump up the wall. It's not fake. There's not extra steps or anything. He could he could actually scale it. But that was that was Lee Duncan's belief that his dog could do it all the time. That's just one thing I mentioned. That Robert could tell you that his dog Betty, that he that his dad didn't think was going to amount to anything, amounted to something because Robert believed in the dog. Right, Robert? 
Yeah, you know, um, I mean, obviously, Rin Tin Tin didn't start jumping a 12-foot wall. Yeah. Um, he probably started out jumping a much shorter wall, and he just yeah, kept yeah. making it higher and higher and higher. But, I mean, you have to think about the process. A lot of times you look out there and you see the finished product. You see, wow, that dog's great. Lassie's great. Lassie had never had any problems. Lassie had anxiety every time a motorcycle rode by. He would freak out. Uh, as a matter of fact, he had such great anxiety that Rudd actually had a hard time fixing it. I mean, I'd seen Rudd fix just about any behavior um, the dog could experience, but he never would have, was able to break that motorcycle chasing. Uh, and um, and then he decided at some point uh, when he got Lassie come home, uh, when he replaced the dog they had chose originally, um, he decided, you know what? I might be able to use that for something. And uh, what he did is he used it to get Lassie to escape because Lassie had such intense anxiety about that motorcycle that he would escape from any enclosure um, just to get that motorcycle. Yeah. Um, so if we wanted Lassie to ease up on the, the, you know, there's that. I think one of the greatest scenes in Lassie Come Home is where the dog has to escape from the kennel because they didn't use cuts. They did it all in masters. And they were, the dog was circling and jumping and failing. And, you know, a lot of dogs, once they fail, they're not yeah, going to do it again, it. you know. Um, and that's what a great dog does. A great dog can fail and still go back into the battlefield again. Um, that's kind of what separates, you know, a great dog from a from a bad dog, or not bad dog, but a subpar initially uh, dog, uh, like Betty. Now Betty's a perfect example because Betty was soft. Um, Betty was, you know, you had to use a real high voice, and you always had to coddle her all the time, um, and she was afraid of everything, um, and she was left in a kennel. See, you know, um, and that, that's not a problem with a lot of dogs being in a kennel too long when they're young. Um, and so I bought the dog from my dad so she, she could live with me. I think I paid him 200 bucks, which is 20 times as much as uh, Rudd paid for Lassie, right? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then Same later both. on, my, my dad wasn't that happy when she was getting jobs, and he wasn't involved in those jobs because the dog now belonged to me. I was a free agent. Betty was a free agent. Um, now, another thing you got to look about, uh, you know, touching on background of dogs, you know, what you have in the beginning. Um, you have to understand that if you're getting a dog that's been a rescue, um, they've probably experienced some things that uh, can give them a lot of anxiety. I, I la ask a lot about background on dogs because I want to know if uh, they were ever, uh, you know, caught, captured, and taken to the rescue, um, if they were uh, had a bad experience of some type. Um, because, you know, what people always wonder why it is that male men always get bitten. It's because of the uniform. Uh, a lot of those dogs have already seen a uniform similar to that, and a guy with a big net, which, is, which means that they don't like the pool guy either. Um, so you have to be aware of, like, where did this dog come from? I wonder what kind of things he experienced because those leave imprints on their head. And what you have to do is you have to reconstruct that scene. You have to make it yeah. something that used to be negative and turn it into a positive thing, and you have to do it again and again and again. Now, it takes a lot longer for a dog that's had that, uh, problem for a longer period of time. Uh, it's an older dog or whatever. It had more intense trauma. Um, so sometimes it's going to be harder, but repetition is the key. Um, I, I had a dog named Jackson that I worked with, and he wanted to bite everybody I walked by. Um, so I took him to Lowe's. I mean, I said, okay, I can handle this dog, and I have a way to fix that. So what happened is every time he saw somebody coming, I'd shove him gently with my leg, and that would turn his head towards me. And then I'd give him a goodie. And then by the time he realized, oh, I can't bite that guy because he'd already passed. Um, then another person would go by. Same thing. I'd shove him, use a distraction. Sometimes I'll use my chain, but other times I'll just shove him with my leg. Now, this is all anxiety. That's why I'm bringing this up because it does relate to separation anxiety because the anxiety about new people. Um, so I'm changing that anxiety by turning it into a, a, a food reward moment. So what happened after just one full lesson at Lowe's. The next time I went to Lowe's, every time he saw a person, he looked at me for the goodie. Because now his expectation is food, not, oh my God, what's that guy going to do to me? He's now looking at that guy an opportunity to get paid. And um, that's what you have to do. To dog. You have to, as my grandfather said, you have to be smarter than the dog. Wouldn't you say, Christoph? Yeah, that's a case of where redirection works pretty well in that specific case. 
But there's a lot. I mean, I don't want to start getting down these things because we, we're, we're going to do a episode just on rescue shelter pound dogs. So there's a lot that we'll cover in that. And I don't, and we're starting to get, get in that direction. So I want to just kind of st- stick with the major. Well, that's because these pound dogs have a lot of anxiety yeah, typically. Right. That's why I right. mentioned it. Yeah, but the, there's a lot that we got to get into specifically on on that. But as far as the as back to the actual separation anxiety, it's yeah, their past, the background is what it, what that touches on is their background. So if you again, it, there's differences, of course, and whether you got a dog that was from a breeder which means it probably was a planned <laughs> pregnancy as it were <laughs> or it, or if you found a dog uh, by yourself uh, a stray or whatever in, in the united states that's that's what they are they're going to be and now other parts of the world they're going to be real dogs that live on their own just like squirrels live on their own or skunks live or raccoons live on their own that's the same way with dogs and the in the rest of the world, the majority of the world is like that. Those dogs will be totally different. Or if you got a dog that has been picked up, like Robert was saying, you know, has been thrown into the pound, or maybe he's been uh, been rejected and given up Miss several Apple. times. Yeah, mm-hmm. but I mean, he's been rejected by families and returned to the pound several times. That's really gonna that's really gonna set up separation anxiety. By the way, that was that's really gonna add to it. And one of the things I just wanna there's a couple of things I wanna touch on just because I was thinking about when Robert was saying it. That's also why you'll find some dogs that don't like men because most of the animal control officers, as they want to be called nowadays, they uh, are men. They're men. And now the, the, some of the people who take care of the dogs when they're at the shelter, the prison, are females. And so they'll, they'll be better with the females than they are with males because males have only represented pain and confinement and bad things. So you got to have that. you got to know about that ahead of time. So that's one of the things that Robert touched on. And, and then just one more thing when we're talking about the, the jumping and the failing, and that's when, uh, when the scaling the walls and stuff. Rent 1010 could actually was trained by lee duncan to f- do misses like he he would try to get that scene of breaking free of the pound for example or the kennel that he's in he does one where he runs he can't quite make it to the top fails goes back tries it fails then goes back further gets a faster run at it and and scales the wall this is all master shots these aren't this is no faking this is nothing there's no stunt things it's no shortening of the of the walls or anything that's why that dog to me is the most incredible action dog that's ever lived and people have not equaled him since that time and it's anyway i would say that i have a i have a video about rin tin tin on the channel i have a couple and you can watch it and what you'll see that scene that i'm talking about i just want to say that because these are great trainers and one of the things that i would throw in there because robert was talking about this and we call them the struggling sit stay trainers <laughs> the guys the guys who are actually struggling huh. with sit stays they're just not at our level and so that's one of the things it needs to be said because you need to know if you're looking for resources and you're looking for expert advice you need to know the level that the trainers that you're talking to now the struggling sit stay people obviously are not going to be have the same sort of experience that we do or not capable of doing the same things we do and that's one of the reasons why we offer consults and video and zoom calls and skype and everything anything in between robert has a book for sale you can find it on amazon i uh, hate to plug them but <laughs> i guess we have to and we're available it, remember the sit, the struggling sit stay people don't have the experience with all these separation anxieties and all the things that we're talking about. And that's why we tend to go on tangents because we want to be very thorough and talk about all the ramifications of things. And that's kind of a problem because we don't script these. We're teleprompter free. We just free form it all the time. We just want to be authentic with everybody and so that you know who the hell we are. <laughs> so basically, but I mean, I think we covered it pretty well without starting to go and talk about everything about dogs, which is what we end up doing most of the time. What do you think, Robert? What do you think? Yeah, no, I mean, all this kind of advice uh, is something that, you know, I'd always 
uh, dreamed personally of having one of those call-in shows where people could yeah. call in. Because I always felt like that would be right up my alley, and that's kind of what I can do for you. And Christoph, via Zoom, um, we can give you solutions face-to-face as opposed to um, on the phone, but we also can do phone consultations. Once again, you know, tell your friends about this. Uh, we're getting more and more people to watch this. And what's what's the purpose of this is to make everybody have, have a better bond with their dog. That's the real, that's the end goal that on that way, you learn new skills. You learn more about your dog. You learn some interesting things. And as a dog owner, you're always a dog trainer. So remember that, people. When you're a that's dog right. owner, you're a dog trainer, whether you like it or not. And it's not a hamster, as Robert was saying. Not a hamster. Or not tropical fish. Yeah. That's I think that's what we should start saying. <laughs> they're, not, they're not tropical fish. Just go, hey, you know, the fish don't care if you come yeah. or you go. They don't care. But anyway, so. <laughs> they're flying around all day anyway. Around. That's it. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. They fish those those damn fish are just lying around. Uh, we'll have an episode about the damn fish and basset hounds. 